So friends, today is Buddha Purnima, a thrice blessed day when Buddha was born, he attained liberation and his absorption into nirvana took place on this date. It's not only a thrice blessed day, but it's a fourth blessed day. Happy Mother's Day to all. So today's topic is memories of great monks. And because it is Buddha Purnima, we are spotlighting Venerable Ananda Moitre, who lived from 1896 to 1998. I first came to know Venerable Ananda Moitre in July 1986. He agreed to participate in the Vedanta Society's celebration of Sri Ramakrishna's 150th birth anniversary in a special harmony of religions retreat at the Vedanta Temple in Santa Barbara, an in-depth Catholic, Buddhist, Hindu interfaith dialogue. And those of you who know, you can see Swami, revered Swami Swahananda on the extreme right, Venerable Ananda Moitre is standing right next to him, his assistant is next to him, and on the far left is Father Gregory Elmer, who represents the uh, Catholic uh, tradition. We nuns had come to know that Venerable Ananda Moitre, a longtime friend of the Ramakrishna mission, and one of the most highly respected teachers of the Theravada Buddhist tradition in the 20th century, was at that time staying at a Los Angeles Buddhist Vihara. So over several days time in July, 1986, he and his attendant stayed as our guest in a house on our property at the Vedanta Center in Santa Barbara. And it was my great privilege to look after his needs during his lunchtime and afternoon tea. And after our large public event, all the nuns met with him in a private Q&A session in our convent library. After which, I drove him back to his L.A. Vihara, but as good fortune would have it, we became captives in a two-hour traffic jam come intimate discussion of this revered monk's personal life's experience and practice on our way to Los Angeles. So what a living treasure this Buddhist monk was, a special blessing also for me. At 91 years of age, Venerable Ananda Moitre was a master of both the Theravada and Mahayana schools of Buddhism. His father had encouraged him to join the monastery at 15 years of age. Did his father early on see his son as a ready-made saint? Not at all. Oscar Wilde once wrote, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. And this was evidently the case, certainly the case, with Venerable Ananda Moitre. He candidly admitted to me that as a young boy, he had an uncontrollable temper to the point where he once fought with another boy and bit his ear, taking a chunk out of it. But shortly after he joined the monastery, and some times later, his father came to speak to the abbot, and young Ananda Moitre overheard the abbot tell his father what a good boy he was, and that gave this future illumined soul great confidence in his early monastic life. Ananda Moitre grew into prominence through the rigorous study and spiritual practice and soon gained the reputation as an outstanding teacher and scholar in Pali, Sanskrit, and several other languages. Venerable Ananda Moitre was one of the few monastic scholars who actively participated in the famous Sixth Council in Burma in 1953 translating and correcting translations of Buddhist texts. 
reputed as an authority of Buddhism. He presided for some time as a president of that council. He also served as the chairman of the Department of Buddhist Philosophy and dean of the Faculty of Oriental Studies at the University of Sri Lanka, and was for some time the vice chancellor of that university until his retirement in 1965. But this exceptional bhikkhu had no scholarly airs. He exuded humility, simplicity of mind, and austerity in his personal habits, eating only one meal a day according to the Theravada Buddhist tradition. It was soon apparent to us how this monk helped popularize Buddhism in the West because he had the special ability to make the most advanced Buddhist teachings accessible to Western Buddhist students at any level and to non-practitioners alike. This is why he was chosen by the BBC's television series, The Long Search, to represent Buddhism in its 1977 ep episode, Footprint of the Buddhist of the Buddha. And you can, you can Google this and it's available on YouTube. But what makes Venerable Ananda Moitre even more accessible and invaluable to us Vedantins is that he was inspired at an early age by Swami Vivekananda. He proudly shared that he had over 1,000 pieces of literature relating to the Ramakrishna Vedanta tradition and Hinduism in his own personal library. And upon leaving us, he, uh, he requested Swami Abhedananda's complete works. Furthermore, he had studied and practiced Raja Yoga and also shared how it became very useful to him as the abbot of so many monasteries in Sri Lanka. As the abbot, it was his practice to practice pranayama a number of hours each day, and that gave him the powers of clairvoyance and clairaudience. During his time, there were 500 Theravada Buddhist monks in various Sri Lankan monasteries. So he could see any problem arising in a faraway monastery, and before it reached ahead, he was able to put a stop to it. But he privately admitted to me that eventually he had to give up this practice of pranayama. Once there was a large festival that demanded his full attention from morning to nightfall. And so there was no time for his practice of pranayama. He tried and tried to find time, but no, the festival preparations and activities would interfere. Venerable Ananda Moitre became more and more frustrated until finally his frustration erupted into anger. And he then realized his practice of pranayama had become an obstacle to his spiritual life. And he immediately gave it up. But as an advanced practitioner and seer, certain powers of the mind remained with him. Lama Alan Wallace, former professor of religion and philosophy at the University of California at Santa Barbara, founder of the Institute of Consciousness Studies in Santa Barbara, and dear friend who spoke in our temple a number of times, was a student of the Dalai Lama, and in his youth had been a Buddhist monk for 12 years. During his time in India, Alan shared with me that due to intense sadhana, he had suddenly lost his ability to sleep. It became very serious, a crisis. No doctor could help him. And he was finally given special permission to travel to the Sri Lankan monastery where Venerable Ananda Moitre was living. When Alan arrived, 
Venerable Ananda Moitre took one look at him, faced him, and ran his hands several inches from him up and down the sides of his body. Three times. Alan re related that suddenly there was a sea change in his body's energy and he then slept for three days solid. What teachings did Venerable Ananda Moitre share with the convent and with me personally? They range from meditation techniques and spiritual experiences to the Buddhist concept of the self and how to spiritualize everyday life. And what, make those, what makes those teachings so valuable to us here in Vedanta? As students of Vedanta, we cannot help but recognize in his Buddhist perspective the thread of religious harmony, the Sanatana Dharma that Sri Ramakrishna stressed. Clearly, there is something within these answers that any aspirant could utilize to enrich his or her life. Venerable Ananda Moitre opened our discussion by explaining that Theravada Buddhism is the oldest school of Buddhism with an oral tradition. Yes, he said, there was a time when monks handed down all scriptures orally. But after three centuries, all Buddhist scriptures were put into writing. However, he said, I learned by heart some large volumes of Buddhist scriptures and even whole grammar books. But then he disclosed, Today in monasteries, which follow the ancient system, our monks have to learn a lot by heart. But the young monks that follow the modern ways memorize very little. In their practice also, they have slight regard for the ancient ways. He further shared, the ab abbot at the monastery where I first joined was considered my teacher and first guru. But some years after his death, when I received more freedom, I sought teachers of other systems just to know whether or not their systems were practical. I then asked if a mantra was given by the teacher and Venerable Ananda Moitre explained, we don't put special emphasis on the mantra, rather we are taught a system to follow. Generally, however, all pious Buddhists repeat the word buddho or no namo buddhaya. The latter one, he said, I repeated almost every moment of my boyhood. Almost every moment of my boyhood. What now are the similarities between Vedanta and Buddhism? Is the Hindu jnani the same as a the Theravada Buddhist, I asked. He answered surprisingly, if anybody reads carefully without any prejudice, the philosophy of Vedanta and the philosophy of Buddhism, there is not much di difference except in the word Atma. If we don't quarrel about words, but try to understand their meaning, then there is no question. As for the Jnani, he said, when I read the Drig Drisha Viveka by Shankaracharya, I found it to be very similar to our Vipassana meditation system, to understand what I am and to discriminate. The Buddhist meditation is mostly the negative side, he said. This is not I. That is not I. It doesn't give any positive side because people, he said, would misunderstand. But as far as I understand the Vedanta system, he continued, the clue to the positive, positive side is also given. But we come to that only when attachment to the negative side disappears. What are the means to achieving the goals? I asked. Venerable Ananda Moitre answered. 
The Buddhist way is to understand what I really am. We call it the Vipassana system. First, the aspirant must build good character, what is called shila, or keeping the precepts. In this, he abstains from evil ways. Second, he must practice concentration, of which there are 40 methods, one of which he must select that is su suitable to his particular temperament. What Hindu yoga books refer to as Trataka Yoga is included in this concentration system. Now here, it's important to note what Vivekananda stated at one time. He said the three cycles of Buddhism were 500 years of the law, 500 years of images, and 500 years of Tantra. You must not imagine that there was ever a religion in India called Buddhism with temples and priests of its own order. Nothing of the sort existed. It was always within Hinduism, always within Hinduism. Only at one time the influence of Buddha was paramount, and this made the nation monastic. We can well understand this assimilation of the Hindu Buddhist thought and practice when we visit the Ellora Caves, where 34 caves, Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain, were built from the 5th to the 10th centuries and they coexisted side by side, demonstrating India's religious harmony prevalent at that time. Secondly, and I'm speaking to you now, what then is Trataka Yoga? It's a tantric method of meditation that involves fixing one's attention on a symbol or a yantra such as the own symbol, a black dot, the image of some deity or guru, or a candle flame. By fixing the gaze, the restless mind too comes to a halt. Now Venerable Ananda Moitre continued. There are many ways to concentrate the mind, he explained. Take some symbol like Buddha's statue as a symbol of infinite compassion. First, fix your minds, your, your eyes on it. Then place a replica of that picture in your mind. Once you see the picture in the mind, then you won't forget it, and the mind will not go to any other object. This is how you develop concentration. He continued, if you keep the mind in this mood of one-pointedness for one hour, then you have come to a certain level of development. You can control yourself. When you forget all other things, no temptation comes. When there is no temptation, then the mind becomes purer and purer. When the mind becomes cleaner, the object you see mentally becomes brighter because the purity of the mind is reflected on the object. At last, he continued, it appears as the disk of the sun or moon or some other light. Then, he said, you can expand that light. At last, you may see light everywhere. You must then fix the mind on this light. From that, you develop one-pointedness to a very, very high level. That, he said, is called samadhi of which there are four stages begin, beginning with Savitarka Samadhi. And those stages we found yesterday delineated in the first chapter of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Now here it's important that with this method of meditation, we're reminded of Vivekananda's boyhood experience. We read in the life of Swami Vivekananda by his Eastern and Western disciples, that singular was the manner in which Naran fell asleep. As soon as he closed his eyes, there would appear between his eyebrows a wonderful spot of light 
of changing hues, which would expand and burst and bathe his whole body in a flood of white radiance. It continues. As his mind became preoccupied with this phenomenon, his body would fall asleep. It was a daily occurrence, which he would court by lying down on his chest. As soon as drowsiness overtook him, the light appeared. Thinking it to be a perfectly natural thing, which happened to everybody, he did not mention it until long after when he asked a schoolmate, do you see a light between your eyebrows at night when you go to sleep? The friend said he did not. I do, said Naran. Try to remember. Do not fall into sleep as soon as you go to bed. Be on alert for a while and you will see it. In later years, there was to be someone who would put that very question to Naran himself. Naran, my boy, do you see a light when you go to sleep? This questioner was his spiritual teacher, Sri Ramakrishna. The phenomenon remained with Naran until the end. It told assuredly of great spiritual past in which the soul had learnt so well to sink itself deep in meditation that the meditative state had become spontaneous with him. Now, Venerable Ananda Moitre continues. Third, he said, the Buddhist has to develop vipassana or introspection. What is this ego? And he begins to analyze his body. As the aspirant begins to examine his body, his mind becomes very sensitive. He feels even the blood circulation inside the body how the cells are rising and vanishing. All these things begin to appear to him. Hence the opening guided meditation coming from a Chinese Buddhist master. At last, he said, he sees that the body is nothing but a collection of material units rising and vanishing every moment. There is no ego, nothing permanent is there. It is called anitya, impermanence. Ananda Moitre continued, then when he examines how his mind works, he sees how all mental states, even good and bad, rise and vanish. There also he finds impermanence. So what he thought was, I is neither body nor mind. His attachment to the so-called I then disappears and he comes to a perfect understanding or the vision of nirvana. In other words, he comes to the realization of the Four Noble Truths. There is suffering. There is a cause of suffering, attachment. There is an end to suffering, renunciation of attachments. The Noble Eightfold Path leads to the renunciation of attachment. This is the goal of Buddhist spiritual life. So what now are the forms of meditation taught in the Theravada Buddhist tradition? I then asked. There are two forms, he said, shamatha and vipassana. Shamatha leads to the suppression of all mental defilements and thereby a higher state of ecstasy and peace of mind. Whereas Vipassana leads to enlightenment, that's a process of discrimination, the eradication of all mental defi defilements and the realization of Nirvana. I then asked, you had mentioned a meditation on the Buddha do those who meditate on the Buddha feel that through his grace, the gates to Nirvana are opened? Venerable Ananda Moitre answered, meditation on the Buddha leads to calmness of mind, but not directly to Nirvana. The only way to realization, he said, is through the practice 
of vipassana meditation. The gates to nirvana have already been opened by the Buddha by pointing out the way there too. Apart from that, we expect nothing more from him. The physician gives the medicine, we have to drink it. The result is a, is a recovery from it. Now this is the Theravada path. It's not necessarily the Zen path or the Mahayana path. The next question naturally followed. Do you feel that the Buddha is a state of mind, a state of experience, or a divine incarnation? He replied, the Buddha is not an incarnation of God, nor a mere state of mind. He is a person who after a long practice of virtues and after deep investigation and introspection attained to full wisdom. There is a potential as a spark under ash within every man that can be blazed to Buddhahood if one so wishes. Now here, Vedanta differs from Buddhism by recognizing Buddha as an avatar. But unlike other divine incarnations, Buddha did not descend, but arose to that state. Now, Venerable Ananda Moitre entered into mindfulness practice. The question came, how can we develop mindfulness? He said, in the beginning, one has to be mindful of every action. This removes forgetfulness and inattentiveness. Then, one has to be mindful of one's feelings and be aware of them as they rise and vanish. Next, he went on, one must be mindful and aware of one's consciousness as it arises and vanishes. Once one has developed mindfulness to that level, one must be aware and mindful of mental characteristics as they rise and vanish. At every stage, one must investigate, he said, their causes and conditions, whether they are subject to change and so on. From this thorough investigation, one realizes that this mind-body process is not mere theory. I asked, or well, he went on, when the full understanding of your microcosmic mundane existence dawns, at that moment, its opposite side or supramundane state will manifest through vision. This is a practice of mindfulness in brief. Next question. When one practices mindfulness, is it a discipline of being aware of only one thing at a time or is it more of an awareness of a spectrum? He answered, in the beginning, one is mindful of only one thing or state each moment. But as one develops mindfulness, one may be mindful of a range of things collectively. Question, is mindfulness more of an awareness of the whole table whereas concentration is awareness of only, say, the jug on the table? He answered, where there is mindfulness, there is awareness. And where there are mindfulness and awareness, there is concentration. Again, where there is mindfulness, there is awareness. And where there are mindfulness and awareness, there is concentration. There may be a difference as regards their development, but mindfulness and awareness never arise without concentration. For example, he explained, if the whole table is the object of mindfulness and awareness, the same table is the object of concentration, which arises simultaneously. If one knows Buddhist psychology, 
This is not a problem. Question. But doesn't the mind tend to be aware of only one thing at a time, but jumping quickly from thing to thing? Is it possible for the mind to be aware of different things simultaneously? He answered. The mind is able to be aware of many things as a whole, as one object. From the Buddhist point of view, what we conventionally call mind is not the same thing every moment. It is a stream of mind units continually rising and vanishing. Within one second, more than 1,000 mind units may rise and vanish though there is only one mind unit per object. Because of the rapidity of the rising and vanishing, we feel as though one mind is aware of many things. Now here, it's very important to interject the difference between consciousness in Buddhism and Vedanta. This is another major difference. In Buddhism, there is no pure consciousness. Consciousness is a mental process. In Vedanta, chit, pure consciousness, is a continuity of consciousness. And this consciousness is separate from the mind. Consciousness, in other words, the Atman, illumines the mind, but it does not belong to it. The mind appears consciousness, conscious because of its proximity to consciousness, because consciousness has illumined the mind so it can think, feel, remember. So that is a major difference, this underlying continuity of consciousness. To continue with the Buddhist mindfulness practice, the question came, so to practice mindfulness, one must be the witness, Venerable Ananda Moitre. Yes, conventionally speaking, I may say you have to be the witness. If you expect to attain inner development, you should not be attached to anything in the world. Question, is there a danger in this discipline of becoming too self-absorbed in one's own mental processes to the detriment of other people and things around one? He answered, if you are properly mindful of yourself, there is no possibility of selfishness to arise within you. Where there is mindfulness, there is no selfishness. Venerable Ananda Moitre continued, suppose you look at yourself from the Vedantic standpoint, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. Brahman is the only truth and the world is illusory. He explained, you are a microcosm. And if you look at the world mindfully and see no reality in it, is there any possibility for selfishness to arise within you? When you realize the microcosm, so also you see the macrocosm from the same point of view. Now this statement is something to really meditate upon Vivekananda explained this relationship according to the Vedanta viewpoint between the microcosm and the macrocosm in his lecture, The Vedanta. He said, each one of us is, as it were, a microcosm, and the world taken all together is the macrocosm. But whatever is in the Vyashti, the particular, we may safely conjecture that a similar thing is happening also outside if we had the power, Vivekananda said, to analyze our own minds, we might safely conjecture that the same thing is happening in the cosmic mind. Now, this is a very lofty thought. And again, it needs study, pursuit, and meditation upon it. We then came to the subject of spiritual experience. I began by asking, is it possible to have glimpses of Brahman. Venerable Ananda Moitre replied, till one attains at least the state called Gotra Bhutnyaya, devil, 
one cannot receive the glimpse of nirvana. The Gotra Bhu stay lasts only one instant, followed by a stream entry stage in which nirvana is clearly seen for the first time. At that moment, one sees that the world is a mass of suffering. Belief in one's separate ego is rooted out. In Sanskrit, the stream entrance is called srota apati. Now here it's important, and we'll illustrate these stages. Here it's important to recognize the four stages of experience in Buddhism. There is first stream entry, where one is free from belief, there is an unchanging ego. Once returner stage, where one becomes partially an enlightened being, free from sensual desire and ill will. Then third, the non-returner stage, that of an illumined soul who does not return to any form of sense life. And the arahant, fully awakened being, having wholly transcended samsara, birth, and rebirth. Venerable Ananda Moitre then try to explain these stages from the standpoint of Vedanta. He said, perhaps the Vedanta description of the consciousness of Brahman, unity within all, refers to some part of the aspirant's experience. In the Buddhist scriptures, a similar state is called Vigyananantya Yatana, or the state of infinite consciousness or mind has pervaded everywhere. Mind has pervaded everywhere. So here, it's important to note, this is one of four dhyanas, which follows the first meditative stage of experiencing the dimension of in infinite space. The second stage is a the experiencing the dimension of infinite consciousness. The third stage is the experience of the dimension of infinite nothingness, sunyata. The fourth stage is experience of the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. Now these are words for us. But, so let's go a little deeper. The question comes, in the second stage of infinite consciousness, does the aspirant experience a sense of fullness within? Venerable Ananda Moitre, he may feel so. How long does such a state last? The vision of nirvana, he said, lasts only for a very short time. Then the aspirant emerges from that state to his usual ordinary level, but less attached to the world. When he attends to his duties, he may not think of nirvana, but the impression of nirvana does not disappear from his memory. Question, is this a vision or samadhi? He answered, from the Buddhist point of view, it is actually samadhi, though it lasts only for a very short time. So here again is another important place to note that the word samadhi in Yoga Vedanta means something a little different than that in Buddhism. In Tantra, Yoga, and Vedanta, there are distinct time frames of one-pointed concentration that correspond to a specific level of union in Sanskrit terminology. And I'll explain. Dharana, or concentration, happens after 12 seconds of one-pointed thought as Sri Ramakrishna described, like oil being poured in an unbroken stream from one vessel to another. And with that experience comes what is called the joy of concentration. There is a joy that comes from that, an inner joy. Next comes dhyana, or meditation, which is 12 times 12 seconds, 2 minutes and 24 seconds. 
That is called meditation. So you can see we use the word meditation very loosely, really. Meditation is a very particular term to a specific time frame of unbroken concentration. Sabhikalpa samadhi, or lower samadhi, is 12 times 2 minutes, 24 seconds, and that is roughly a half hour of absorption, 28 minutes, 48 seconds, and then 12 times that is 5 hours, 45 minutes, 36 seconds. So the time frames determine the level and also the nature of the experience itself determines the level of samadhi or vision. Venerable Ananda Moitre continued, but if the aspirant likes, he may fix his mind on nirvana and remain in the same mood for hours. This stage, stage is called samapati. Others though, though they can never forget that experience, may not be able to live in that mood because they attend to their householder duties. He again continued, those who are able to continually utilize that experience will quickly attain perfection. Others who do not may delay in attaining the goal for as long as seven lives. It's very specific. The question came, so that is a clear example of the importance of reliving one's experiences in meditation, isn't it? I asked. Yes, he stated, till you attain full realization. And in fact, my teacher used to say also, relive your experience at the beginning of your meditation. If you've had anything, even try to remember and relive the time of your initiation, the feeling you had at that moment. And if you had any spiritual experience after that, try to re relive that and then move on into your meditation. Question came, how should one react to a spiritual experience? Is there a danger of feeling too fulfilled by it? He answered, suppose one receives the first experience the experience of infinite space. One should tell it to one's meditation teacher and clear any doubt about the genuineness of the experience. And there's a real strong feeling in our tradition one should not divulge one's spiritual experience to others. And why? Because it dissipates the experience itself. And second, if one hears your experience, then one may become jealous or one may begin to imagine that they are having a similar experience. The mind is very suggestive. So one must really keep control over one's experience and speak only to one's teacher or to one's uh, upaguru. Venerable Nandamoitre continued, if one is satisfied with that first experience, it will be an obstacle to further progress. Be watchful of your experience and examine whether or not you are inclined to feel that, ah, I have got an experience. If you are attached to that experience, you have not fully realized. Go further and practice under the instructions of your guru, he said. Read the instructions of holy persons and follow them. So we see that in both the Buddhist and Vedanta practices, we find the importance given the teacher as a necessary spiritual guide. For it's too easy for an aspirant to become misled by one's own limited knowledge and ego. Swami Prabhavananda explained, Maharaj Swami Brahmananda had wonderful insight into the character and spiritual growth of individuals. A friend of mine, he said, whom he knew, renounced the world and went to Rishikesh to practice austerity. He would not accept the guidance of any guru. After a few months practice, he wrote to me saying that he had attained samadhi. At that time, I was with Maharaj at Kankal and told him the substance of my friend's letter. 
Why, exclaimed Maharaj, I saw him about 10 days ago. I looked into his eyes. He has not had samadhi. No doubt he has had some kind of mystic vision, the vision of light, perhaps, and he mistakes that for samadhi. An aspirant is often led astray like that, Maharaj said, when he has no guru to advise him. Samadhi, is it an easy matter to attain samadhi? We saw Swamiji in samadhi only a few times. Sri Ramakrishna alone we saw in samadhi many times each day and night. So let us end here for now. The second part of this interview and informal conversation will be on Sunday, May 22nd for our Dallas uh, devotees. Uh, and for our Houston devotees, it will take place the next time I come to Houston in June. And at that time, Venerable Ananda Moitre will discuss the stages of illumination, the spiritual heart, the higher self, both in Vedanta and Theravada Buddhism, reincarnation, spiritual qualifications, obstacles to spiritual life, and how to spiritualize our everyday life. <laughs>